Welcome back guys to Shackham Gaming and as I promised this episode is going to feature the complete developer commentary that was recorded for the remastered version. Enjoy! Hello everybody, I am Tim Schaefer. I was the uh, project leader on Full Throttle and uh, welcome to this exciting commentary. I'm Larry Ahern and I was lead animator. I'm Casey Ackley, I was production manager. I'm Stephen Shaw and I was the lead programmer. I'm Peter McConnell, and I was the composer. And I'm Clint Bajakian, and lead sound designer. Is there a reason you're not doing it like Drunk History? Do you, do, would you like a drink? Because we have. Wouldn't some? that be funny? No, not right now. <laughs> I think we come up with a lot more stories. Yeah, we'll do that for our YouTube channel. Okay. Drunk Game Comedy. All right, you guys. Asphalt and trouble. Hit burger, you're dumber than dirt. Mr. Corley, if you'd only listen. So this is our dramatic intro to the game. We want to be super cinematic. And uh, it has the fabulous voice of Roy Conrad, the late great Roy Conrad. And now, now we're getting into our celebrity voiceover. Anyone know who the celebrity is? Yes. Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill as a Ripper, super evil. He does a great job. He's he sure does. He, uh, we, we knew a little bit that he would do a great job, not just from the Star Wars stuff, but he was already the Joker at this time. He's already the Joker in the animated, one of the animated TV series. Uh, uh, so who was Corley? Who do you think you're? Malcolm Corley was um, Hamilton Camp. Hamilton Camp, oh, who was also Tim's passed away, unfortunately. What do you know about there's my wife. Oh, yeah, you got to go back to that. It's a little gold Tim. A little gold Tim butt. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, there'll be a, a glory shot of that later. <laughs> that was a Charlie Ramos. I remember uh, Peter McConnell making fun of me for the destabilizing inner ear condition line. <laughs> Here comes Ben Now, this is... Uh, are we using um, the Rebel Assault engine yet? Oh wait, yeah, my dude scene's coming up. Everybody cover your eyes. Nobody look. There it is. Oh, oh there it is, all right. The only Decent difference... exposure. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome, everybody, for that. <laughs> and some great Gone Jackals music comes in here. This is still an uh, introduction that I love to watch because it was so, it was really different than Day of the Tentacle, which is our, our last game where we were we had a lot of trouble um, just getting the founding fathers to animate as they jumped out the window when you, you chopped down the, you know, when you scared them out of the Constitutional Congress. Moving that many pixels on the screen was impossible, but this time we were using the Rebel Assault engine, which was called Splash. Splash. Yeah. And uh, Steve, well, how did the Insane Engine? Wait, wait, now what? Right. Hey, you tell us what right. was going on right. here. The Insane Engine, it was the Insane Engine. Splash was the tool that you created. Right. Uh, okay. Streams with. Right. So this came about because the uh, advent of CD-ROMs, which had basically infinite storage right. compared to what we're used to on the three and a half inch. Uh, oh, look at these amazing credits. Here comes Steve's. Glory <laughs> shot. Yeah, nice. Of course. Try getting these today in Call of Duty or what have you. What, opening right. credits? Yeah. Yeah. I love opening credits. Yeah. I guess, I feel like they just um, set the mood yeah. and exactly. they, uh... oh, Brian Rich. Uh, they set the mood and they um, make you feel like you're going to see something awesome and epic. You know? Absolutely. Plus, you get to hear all this awesome music. Live band? So CD-ROMs came out and Mist was a big hit and then uh, Lucas made Rebel Assault, which was like took 3D uh, rendered trenches and you could fight TIE fighters in these trenches, right? Right. And then we're like, we'll, we'll take that. Yeah, he came up with, Vince came up with the, the streaming engine and it did really well and he kept doing improvements on it for Rebel Assault 1, Rebel Assault 2. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And this got put into here, and uh, yeah, it was mind-boggling time because like he's like, look, I'm gonna do this thing. It's gonna store the data for one frame, and then the next frame, it's not gonna have the whole frame. It's only gonna have the data that changed. And we're like, what? That's that's a compression that's idea that has talk. never been. That's crazy. <laughs> so it allowed us to like do full-screen uh, animation. Maybe old man Corley got himself in trouble. Yeah, maybe they took the old guy out back and worked him over with a two by four. Hmm, an appealing notion, but improbable. <laughs> and I'm sorry about telling this story, but we were talking about making a movie of this with MTV. You remember that? MTV wanted to put this on a liquid television. Or, and, um, <laughs> and I was talking to, I was in MTV in, in New York, and I was talking to a guy about it. And um, he was saying that he was playing this intro to the game and that Mike Judge had walked by. Was, Mike Judge was doing Beavis and Butthead at the time. And he walked by and he stopped and he walked back in. He listened. He's like, 
Did that guy just say, whenever I smell Same asshole, page. I yeah. think I'm looking at <laughs> 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 and, and that's what I think of whenever I hear that line, and I had to tell that story. We probably can't use that story in the commentary, though. So <laughs> now, you, now you know. Sure you can. Does this look like an escort? I remember the dumbest things like the back of that, the back of the bar where the dumpster is. I just remember telling Peter Chan to get rid of the ladder. Like he had a ladder there that went up onto the roof, and that was okay. part of the, <laughs> learning. Like you can't put interesting things in adventure games because like the player's gonna want to go up that ladder and climb up there. And so he had to paint it out. He was so mad about that. <laughs> but um, and I think of this room where we started talking about how did we do a game that stylized? Do you remember this, Larry? Like stylized, like but not a cartoon for kids. Because we, we didn't want to go, quote unquote, realistic, but we wanted to do something yeah. that was more adult. Mm -hmm. And uh, remember, you guys talked a lot about Mike Mignola yeah, and Hellboy, and, Hellboy so. and how things disappeared into the blackness a lot. And so you can see in, that, in the bar, there's a lot up in the TV and the pipes and stuff. It just kind of disappears into yeah. nothingness. Take that. So here, there's a puzzle where you kick <laughs> open the door after this cutscene, right? There's a, you kick open the you door. You kick open the door was just like a kind of a character setting Thing for us, we're like, we always talked about how you know Bernard Bernoulli and David Tentacle, if he had to, if he had to like get through a locked door and all he had was a bologna sandwich, that he would figure out a way of like putting the mayonnaise on the floor and sliding the bread under and then poking the, taking the toothpick and poking the key through the hole and dropping it in the point. And then Ben Throttle would just eat the sandwich and kick the door down. And that was like how we were like expressing character through puzzle design in these games. And Which is why this game is two hours long. It's why it's a little shorter. <laughs> that was also Uh, fixed your door. And there's the uh, the, the bartender's name is Quahog. I don't know if that comes up ever in the game, but his name is always Quahog, mm -hmm. which is like from Moby Dick. It's how Queequeg misspells his own name when he signs into the log of the ship. Yeah. The okay. Piece of yeah, whenever I do a <laughs> search on it, I would always get Queequeg. I'm like, is that supposed yeah. to be? Because I remember you saying it was related to that. And then. Um, working with the animation team, trying to do the high-res versions of all these characters. Every time I got an email about it, it was spelled differently. Yeah. <laughs> it's, well, uh, it's Quig. <laughs> it's Quig. You know what might look better on your nose? What? The barn. Oh man, dream sequence. I remember this scene was literally tossed together in about an hour. We need something in here after the wreck. You mean lovingly crafted? Lovingly. Yes. <laughs> in an hour. Sorry, that's not what's supposed to be on the commentary about how much effort was put into these. A lot of it was we had such a tiny team and we're going, the whole thing will be fully animated. It'll be crazy. Do you, watching this, I'm realizing like after Day of the Tentacle, where we had just three full screen animations in the whole game. Like, when, did we sit down and say, like, hey, this next game is going to be crazy, and we're going to have all these full screen animations the entire time? Yeah, we said it was going to be a completely cinematic thing. Everything hey, is, is going to be so seen. Because I don't remember realizing what we were taking on in the beginning. No, we had Which no is idea. probably the special talent I have that lets me do with these games. We just <laughs> did not think about what this is going to entail. Because we, we would basically plan out the scene, and about the only thing I remember doing to try to keep it reasonable was saying, if we edit enough, no one shot will have that much animation in it. <laughs> you know, just as the animation's getting complicated, cut to another angle, you know? Right. But still, the scene was gonna last X amount of frames long. It's like somewhere in there, you're gonna have to animate something. Yeah. So we just did a lot of fast cutting MTV style stuff, and we, we kept saying, well, if you cut to a close up of the face, you know, then not much is moving. I mean, it's kind of like, if you do a master shot and you have a bunch of people doing stuff in it, that would take forever to animate. Yeah. People picking up objects, putting them down, lip syncing. Yeah. But if you cut to just someone's eyes moving slightly, it's more dramatic and it is less. Yeah, so it was always like, you know, the guy that's swinging the wrench at the thing that's going to blow up, you'd get him to start to move, and then you'd show the reaction of the guy being surprised. And then you hear a boom, and then you cut back and the was forever, Maureen got her name. Originally, the story had two twins that were the twin daughters of Malcolm Corley, and they're named Maureen and Tina after these two girls who lived in the dorm with me in college. <laughs> and then we cut Tina. So, <laughs> sorry, Tina. <laughs> Oh, good, you're not dead yet. I might still get a quote. <laughs> Chan does a lot of uh, designs that where you can see, like, the story of the town is that it's sunk. There's obviously a building that was here before, and it just sunk, and they're just like, ah, screw it, let's build another house on top of it. 
and they just build another one. Like a lot of <laughs> double, he does a lot of double houses. There's some of that in the second house, like two roofs upon roofs. It's not the Smart. blood, it's the way you were. Well, twisted up like a pretzel. And this is a pretty ambitious game. Like, I feel like on, on every level, it's we were just It's like, a long conversation. We got in way over. Well, now, does anyone remember? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think we were thinking about things like, I, well, for me, I was thinking about Road Warrior and Yojimbo. Because Road Warrior, just for the, I just love the way, the just dramatic, gritty story being told, yeah. like, an, like an opera almost. And then um, Yojimbo is just the stoic here, you know, the you seen Yojimbo with the Tashir Mifuni is like this really stoic main character who's not like a big tough guy who who really shows off a lot, but he's really quiet and quiet until he goes and he like then he goes and kills twenty samurai, you know, just really <laughs> quickly. And uh, and Ben was really um, inspired by him. And then I I got the screenplay for uh, the Road Warrior uh, somewhere, and in the first shot of it, um, Mad, uh, Mad Max like. He gets to a fork in the road. He doesn't know where to drive to, and he pulls over, and he finds a wreck of a car, and he takes a bumper off of it, and he throws it in the air. Wherever the bumper lands, he drives off that way, which is exactly how Yojimbo starts with him doing it with a stick. I was like, I knew it. I knew this is all one big part of this generalized lone hero thing going Yeah, we were looking at uh, Clint Eastwood, man with no name stuff, too. Everybody mm -hmm. squints like Clint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, easier to animate, right? Yeah, squint. exactly. Yeah. Who's out there? This is the first scene that you hear the uh, Chitlin's Whiskey and Skirt song. Yeah. That's my favorite song. Increased chances, yeah. Well, the great John Spiegel of Chicago, friend it, of ours. It, it, it creates a narrative uh, problem in the game, though, which is that... It's I've, apocalyptic. I, yeah, we were always like, is this, a, this is not a post-apocalyptic game, this is just an alternate reality, like an alternate world. Like, there's nothing about, there's been no nuclear devastation. This is just a, a gritty, you know, highway-based part of the country, you know, and in the future. And, um, but a lot of people thought it was like, cause it is inspired by Road Warrior a lot in terms of its cinematics and the sure. way it tells the story. But um, there's nothing post-apocalyptic about it. Um, but that song is all about nuclear, like it's a post-apocalyptic <laughs> song. And so it, it kind of feeds into that. So I, uh, um, it's good to create false rumors, don't you think? Yeah, exactly. Remember the, uh, the uh, this was one of our big things was changing the interface so we get a full, full screen game this time around as opposed right. to the tentacle where you had to go, you had to look up and down um, but in this game we wanted you there's a theory that like people you should have the interface where people's eyeballs are and their eyeballs on the cursor so let's make the interface pop up on the cursor and um, I remember that you hadn't seen that a lot I think at the same time you guys over at Lucas Learning were doing remember the secret project. The secret library archive project. There was a. You guys were doing one where the the, the interface popped up near the cursor. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm telling you, that was cutting edge, you guys. <laughs> cutting edge cursors. Oh, this is the first scene we did. I always thought this is the first thing we ever wired up in the game. Yeah, this we did this one specifically oh, yeah. for was it CES or whatever oh, else, and we had to get it done, <laughs> and we had just the assets for this. That cracks me up that we He's made like a two room puzzle sliding. for CES. Did we do a special version of Ben? Cause like he's yeah, all darkly black. lit. We didn't have dynamic lighting back then, no, did we? Right? No, no, no. Like nowadays we'd be painted with a certain color that we would like yeah. tune up and down. But here I mean, we must have painted a whole nother 3D we had in this oh, game. Yeah, was yeah. that the CES, Tim, where we had that guy on the motorcycle out in front of the booth? I don't remember. Pretending to be Ben oh, Throttle. Nice. I don't I remember, know, did we have a booth babe, dude? We had a booth, dude, and like all us ladies were swooning. I just remember always taking pictures, thinking that guy was a hunky man. We all wanted to go take a picture with him. Looks nothing. Did I even get to go to that CES? I don't know. I don't think I don't remember seeing any of this. Tell me about it. Well, it was just a little, you know, booth in the back, but then there was the guy with the motorcycle right out front, and he was totally drawing people in. Maureen. Maureen is the. Kath Susie does the voice. She has a lot of cartoons. You oh, look at yeah. the credits. Yeah. Almost any cartoon you're watching, Kath Susie yes. will show up. She does a great job with Maureen's voice, and she came back later on Brutal Legend and did um, um, uh, Lita Halford. This was uh, one of the, I feel like this is like one of the first puzzles we designed for the game, and I have fond uh, feelings about it. I don't know if everyone likes this puzzle. They might hate it. But I was, 
we were like, this game is not going to have a lot of complicated inventory combining puzzles where you collect a whole bunch of stuff and then put together an inventory. It's going to be mostly all on the screen. So, like, here you come up and there's a rope, there's a chain you can pull and it opens the gate, but then you can't uh, keep it open when you run through it. And the trick is to do something counterintuitive. You have to lock the gate. And I was so happy with that because it was all just right on the screen. You did have one inventory item, which is the lock. But then again, some people like all puzzles, hate that puzzle. So, (laughs) you know, I like it. Junk. There's my car, my actual car. Oh, so, so oh, that's that, the Tim Mobile. Oh, yeah. Do you still have that car? Uh, it's in a garage in Reading. Because so <laughs> <laughs> I was driving. I uh, inherited. I bought this the car for my dad, which is his '69 Le Mans, which is I mean, it looks like a GTO. It's a really fun car to have. And then I go at lunch one day uh, with a bunch of Lucas Arts co-workers in it. Uh, it was, someone before I started it, someone was like, "Do you smell gas?" And I was like, "No, <laughs> you're silly." And I started it, and then boom. That was me and Michelle Harold. Yeah, and. Uh, <laughs> And and you remember like uh, black smoke came out yeah, of the froster vents and everybody was like, "Yeah, we had jumped." I was like, "Get out of the car!" I <laughs> jumped out and I run to this jewelry store to use nine one one. And secretly, I've been wanting to call nine one one all my life, right? Like, you, know, like, you just be like, "Oh, someday I'm gonna." Have, so I call it. And they're and like, then, "You're at the jewelry store. It's a robbery. What's going on?" <laughs> and I and I ran back to the car and there was a pool of fire underneath the car. And there are already fire people there, like firefighters there, because I was across the street from the fire department. I could have just run. To, I could have run to the fire department to bring them over. And anyway, they put out the fire, and then it was really bad. There was there's bubbles embedded in the windshield from just the heat. Jeez. And you guys went. You, know, you guys go back to the office. So you guys went back to the office while I hung around with the tow truck. And uh, you told Peter Chan what had happened. And so Peter Chan happened to be painting this art. And so he's like, "Well, I guess Tim scar is toast. I'll put it in the junkyard." <laughs> And he painted my beautiful car in the junkyard. The kind of that was when you actually had to run somewhere to make a phone call. Yeah. Yep. Bad dog. Am I cool or what? You're amazing. Did you notice the uh, tattoo foreshadowing on Maureen's? She's got a little bit of a vulture's tattoo because it's like a big uh, spoilers. Uh, I won't say in case you're playing this game and you don't know. But there's some foreshadowing right there. By the way, I had somebody contact me a couple months ago asking for the definitive version of the vulture's tattoo. Oh my god! Wow! That was feeling terrible because you have. She's gonna ink it on her, and I'm like. I don't know. There's a pixelated version, but it's so messed up. And then there's a sketch that I have, but it's not the final one because I think trans, trying to translate it to pixels and then shrinking it down, a lot of that didn't read. So I'm trying to figure out, well, I don't know what to tell her, which is the official one because it's kind of... I I just sent her a bunch of stuff and said, take your best guess. <laughs> <laughs> Find my daughter, Ben. Find Maureen. Maureen? I feel like we were watching, uh, started watching a lot of Hong Kong movies at this point because there's a lot of that like reflection in the toaster right. that you see the bad guys coming is taken right out of either Hong Kong movies or um, Hard Target, which was the uh, John Claude Van Damme movie. All right. We saw it right when we were making this. So also the, easier to animate the villain really, really small and reflection. Yeah, and wiggly in the toaster. <laughs> I wonder how many... People say they use Hard Target as their It's basically this, <laughs> yeah. this is Hard Target, the game. And I think only two people were inspired by Hard Target. Van Damme and Tim. Holy motors. <laughs> That's it. So I remember not, we didn't want days. to talk about, at one point the schedule had slipped, but I didn't want to be, uh, talk about how much because I was too scared to think about it. And, and you're like, do you want to know what the budget is? I'm like, no. I was like, what is it? No, what is it? It was like, it's a million dollars. <laughs> and we had like gone from Monkey Island, which was, I think was $200,000, and just had never conceived of money like that before. And like, this game is, it's the first one that's like, it's a million dollars. You could only whisper the I, I remember <laughs> I remember breaking that mark and everybody talking about like, holy crap. A million dollars. I do. I remember, I remember spending countless hours just staring at the budget. Where I'd like have to put in the actuals for the month, 
and then based off of that, project how the rest was going to change and add more months uh, and, and more dollars. And... So you remember the scum debug hey. uh, key? The scum debug key? Hey. No. What was the scum no debug time key? To talk. Was it? No. It's Control D or something, Matilda. You gotta help me. Oh, after Matilda. You, you type in, no, you type in like Control D and Matilda on the keyboard, and it would turn on all the scum jump codes and all the. Oh, I wonder if that shifted in the game. It did. It did? Yeah. Don't try that. Don't try that at home. <laughs> <laughs> Control D, till, the what? It's like Control D, and then you type in Matilda. Don't do it. Take one of these fake IDs to get through the roadblocks. Well, nice knowing you. Gotta hit the road, you know. Uh-oh. He did have a fuel leak, and he took my fuel line to fix it. That trucker's gonna die for what he did. I remember Casey was Tim Wrangler. No, Tim Wrangler. <laughs> but this wasn't, it was grim where you were like listed as pre-production. I was the production right? manager on Full Throttle. Okay. Although I love the name of the title producer. producer, I was really disappointed. Wait, who was the producer? Did we have, well, we didn't have didn't, a producer? We didn't have a producer. We had a project leader. Yeah. And actually when we did have producers, I remember that didn't help so much because it would be somebody that was on like half time or less. It was me and Wayne splitting all the projects down the middle. Open up, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> the, the very beginning, yeah. Tucker, can they, if we still don't respect yeah. producers around here, still treat them like, right? I'm regular now. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, that's a more prestigious title than producer. <laughs> the Velvet Underground just wouldn't have worked for this. Oh, yeah. So originally we were trying to get music, we were thinking about getting licensed music, and uh, we talked to some record companies, and Lots they offered us for free the. The entire catalog, the entire catalog of, the of, the of the Velvet Underground. Which was <laughs> such cool music. Which is, yeah, who she loved, but I was like, I don't know if this fits the biker theme. And then also, like, The Clash was one of them offered to, because they were they were shipping a box set of these things. Yeah, I think The Clash was, but and they the were we too, wanted was, obviously, yeah. We wanted Soundgarden. Right? Right. I wanted Soundgarden because they had a song called Kick, Kickstand, right. and it just set in the kickstand, and, that, and that song Kickstand was so perfect for it. So, should I tell him? Sorry, we went down to LA. Yes. <laughs> went, me and Jackson Morrison went down to LA to go to AM Records to like to try and get them to give us. And we hadn't done any licensed music really at all, except for like um, Star Wars music. And um, we we showed the game to them. We showed them the the uh, CS demo with the, the gas <laughs> siphoning and stuff. And um, and it was these young executives there, like this is really cool. We really like it. And then like the big guy showed up, and I think he was like either A or M. I, I, my, my recall of the story was, being Mr. M. Mr. M came yeah. in and um, he sat down and um, and the younger guy was like, okay, uh, Tim, why don't you tell them all about the game? Mr. M was like, no, I want to hear from you. Maybe the boss was wrong and she ain't coming here. She's coming. We just got here first. That means all we have to do is sit here and wait. Yeah, so where were we with 3D? Like, 3D had already entered the world of games, right? But we were like, no, we love 2D stuff, but we have all these vehicles we have to make. Dark, Dark yeah. Forces was was just before this, right? Or just, it was... It was concurrent. With it this was right? concurrent. It shipped around the same time. It shipped still. around the same time, that's right. Because we technically shared a rap party. And that was sort of knocking off Doom to some extent. It was, I had 3D... So was Rebel already things. happening? Because we had a 3D department. There was like three guys. Yeah. I think Rebel that's all. Around. I think yeah. to, that's why we had it what them were, was for the Rebel Assault stuff. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, we were talking about there's no way we can draw. Like, we were looking at all the uh, reference material from that anime film, Akira. All the motorcycles were like, there's no way we can draw this stuff by hand. But then we were trying to figure out how do we get it to look 2D? Well, that's all of them. And just uh, compressing the heck out of the no. palette and uh -huh. simplifying it. This was a... Because they probably didn't have the cartoon renderers back then, right? No, we didn't have cell no. shading or anything. No, so no I remember there was a big struggle was trying to get it to actually match. Yeah, so we were just trying to limit the palette, and then we had the uh, we had the 3D Ben on the bike, and then we would draw over it. <laughs> and 
this is the area where we were originally going to have the whole Ricky Myron section, right? Uh, we were jumping over. Yeah, yeah jumping jor, the... a gorge. We do have that here with the gorge. Oh, yeah. and jump over. No, but there was the whole the stunt show and the whole Ricky Myron character stuff. Ricky Myron, by the way, is the kid I went to. I was in fourth grade, oh, yeah. and we're on the playground, and I just, I had this rock, and I, for no reason at all, I just, I'll see how high I can throw this rock in the air, and I threw it as high as I could, and it came down, and it hit Ricky Myron in the head. Oh, my God. And he was like, why'd you do that? <laughs> and I was like, you know what? Someday I'm going to make you a star. I'm going to, no. Put you in the game. I'll make it up to you. I'm going to put you in the game, and yeah. then I'm going to cut you out of the game. Yep, yep. I'm, you're going you're to be a reference, but you're going to be a great, um, a great daredevil. Lots of interesting backstory because it was the stuff we cut remember because we the game was getting so huge and we're like we'll never finish this mm -hmm. and i think there was that and one other section we were looking for stuff to cut and everything was too interconnected to everything else we're like we can't cut anything except the ricky myron section that's kind of its own <laughs> piece boring. I, there's a sound that you're driving over a rough road here yeah <laughs> steve I, I remember you were uh, duly hard on me to get that uh, sound right of the tire going over those reflectors in the center of the road. And it's true, it, it, it makes that sound. You, we all know that sound. It's like, yeah. It sort of sounds like puck. You know, puck, 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 puck. And uh, I have to admit, I had a really hard time making that sound. Finally, one time I was just driving and holding my arm out the window of my truck <laughs> with a microphone and running over those things. I don't know if I ended up using those, but it was a tough sound to make to get it right. Where is this place? This is like a circle of bikers randomly driving. Well, it's like Highway 9. Actually, I wonder if we do. There's a, there's a highway called Highway 9 on the way down this like Santa Cruz that bikers love. It's an actual like biker road where bikers go on a lot, and there's a lot of biker bars on the way and stuff. So that's that's real. That's right out of the yeah. pages of California history. Is that 17 that you're talking it's about? It's off of 17. Or it's, it's, the, it's the mountain road that you would take next to 92 and the, and the Highway 1. Well, a good boost left in it. Oh, Tim Chainsaw. Oh, I threw a party at my house, which was up in the woods. In the oh, yeah. You know? And it was in the middle of a and forest. And we couldn't get to it. And it had a long driveway that went through um, the forest. Right. And we had had a terrible storm, and it was pitch dark. And the first person to arrive at my party was Tim, driving alone. And he came up to a fallen tree across the driveway. And I emerge with a chainsaw oh. under my hand <laughs> and go walking up to Tim. And a mask made Tim. of human flesh. <laughs> <laughs> and I go walking up to Tim, and you were genuinely scared. I he wonder why. About stuff like this. <laughs> uh, up in the woods of Nicasia. <laughs> I remember that party. That was, He's that was a was good that party. The party that that So I remember that when when we were in the end of QA and Tim decided to go play pool one night in San Francisco. This was before cell phones. Uh -huh. And something came up and I had to find Tim and bring him back. I think it was for the bunnies. And because uh, there was a bug that had to be fixed and we had to ship this game. And so all I knew was that Tim had gone to play pool in San Francisco. Well, I didn't have any work to do. <laughs> right. So, so I called. I had the phone book, and I called every pool hall in San Francisco looking for him. This makes me sound like a totally different person. I know. <laughs> but he wasn't, like in any, he wasn't in any of them. <laughs> so then I'm like, okay. So the last pool hall, I said, okay, so maybe he's in a bar with a pool table. Can you tell me the name of a bar that has a pool table? <laughs> and he did. And then I looked that up, and I called that. And then when he wasn't there, I just kept doing that. Until finally, Are you kidding me? <laughs> finally, I found him in some bar with a pool table. Oh my! Goodness. And uh, it was a kilowatt. When he picked up, when he picked up the bar phone, he was terrified because he was like, "How did you find me?" <laughs> <laughs> Actually, awesome. I don't remember. This is crazy. I can't believe you found me by calling random bars. It makes me sound way cooler than I am. Too. I like this. Like, but what did I, what could I have done? I wasn't programming. I want to know how she described it. Actually, I did program yeah. <laughs> It was something that you had, you had to make a was, call on something. It was something. my actual bug. <laughs> yeah. It, it was either your bug or you had to make a decision right then and there.
as to what we're gonna Bunnies do about it. Yeah, you remember, you remember how we used to get, how we got the rock and roll to sound so good in the game? Oh, we just deliberately distorted it? Yeah, we turned it up so that, we turned it up because of the low sample rate, we turned it up so it was about, I think about 50% too, too hot. Clipping. So, so it was clipping, so all the waveforms were being chopped. Right. For all you audio geeks out there. <laughs> um, it's, it's, a, it's a real no-no. But it sounded, it you know, it's the best way to do it for that particular well, sound. Since, yeah. since we're talking about Smush, which originated, I believe, with Rebel Assault, right? With Vince, mm -hmm. uh, in an earlier incarnation, at least. And Vince uh, liked to do everything himself. And we were a little miffed in the sound department because we found out that he had dubbed the Star Wars main theme himself using a boombox. Right. And the <laughs> headphone output. Right, right. So, you know, it, 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 more geeky audio stuff, but basically a, a headphone signal is an amplified signal, right, to drive the headphones. And he put that right into the uh, computer, to the Sound Blaster card and sampled it. And it sounded really big and huge and over the top. And we said, Vince, let people do, do this who know how. So we couldn't get it to sound as good as he had. <laughs> no matter what we did. And then I finally realized that. the only way to get it to sound better, or even just a little better than what he had had, was to deliberately chop off clip it and, and chop off overdrive the, the analog yeah. uh, right. signal and overdrive everything. Souvenirs here! There was a local radio Wait, DJ minutes. named Alex Bennett, who oh, was right. a big oh, fan yeah. of Dana Kennedy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Motors merchandise. And he was a fan of ours. We got him to do the voice of the uh, stadium announcer. That's right. That's how it's funny. He was like the Howard Stern before Howard Stern. Mm -hmm. yeah. As I think you would say. That's what happened. A regular job will do to you. Mm -hmm. Didn't we get him to do some sort of PR thing on the show? I, think I got to go on the show and promote. Wasn't he at the rap was party? He probably was at the rap yeah. party, too, yeah. yeah. He was an institution in San Francisco radio. Yes, he was. KML and all these different stations. Live 105. Live 105, yeah. 105, yeah. He was a, he was a big deal, and then he got his voice in the game. Oh, great. You killed the battery. Do you remember going to Skywalker Ranch to record a video that was for marketing purposes, which was the Gone Jackals playing? And I don't know what, this is for some B-roll that we recorded for marketing news. But they also took a picture of the band and they made a leather jacket that's full throttle on it. And we, we filmed them playing in the same sound stage that the London Symphony Orchestra did Star Wars music on. And um, I just remember them came, they came in and they wanted to pose with their bikes on the sound stage. So they rolled, they, there was like the night watchman who was like letting us into the building. We had permission to be in there, but he like saw the motorcycles getting wheeled in. He's like, are those, are those okay to be indoors? I'm like, yeah. And like he said, uh, and he asked one of the, we had these actual biker guys who owned the bikes, wheel them in. And he's like, I think I think a leak on the woods, a hardwood floor in here, and the, the biker guy was just like, "She'll leave her mark." <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good that's what like, you're But it's no big deal. <laughs> Okay, I have to talk about this puzzle because it's causing me a lot of grief. This is the second puzzle everyone gets stuck on, and they hate <laughs> oh, yeah, and they get really angry. One. So the puzzle is supposed to be that you have to line up your knees, your eyes with the crack on the wall, and you're, the puzzle is supposed to be that you. Oh, Maureen wasn't a grown-up woman at that time; she was only a four-year-old girl. So the crack should be much lower, and if you go there and kick it, it works. But um, we're worried people would just brute force it and kick everything. So we made it so you couldn't kick it unless all these gauges were all lined up. Which is a little contrived. <laughs> and so, but the thing that, that's where I learned in the rule of adventure games: if people, if it's possible at all to brute force something, they will do it. They'll be like, well, I guess I just gotta kick every pixel on this wall. And so people would kick every pixel and be like, why did you make that stupid puzzle where you have to kick every pixel? And I'm like, it was supposed to be that this other thing. It figured out. It's supposed to think the way I thought about it. And so that was a big learning experience for me. Wow. I remember going into Tim's office at one point as the deadline was looming, saying, Tim, you got to cut, cut the mine road or the bunnies. Oh, He's remember. like, I'm not cutting either one. Mine road or the bunnies? Yeah, I'm like, you got to cut one, Tim. Something's got to go. We oh, already cut so much on the game. I was like, we can't cut anymore. <laughs> and the bunnies are crucial to the, uh, <laughs> the narrative. <laughs> Come 
Dumb Carnage Marathon. Let's meet our Crash Cage Gladiators. It's George. George Lucas. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, 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 awesome. Awesome. that's awesome. No, that's not George. It's, uh... <laughs> Somebody in a George costume. I love the hair. It's Marine. Yeah. Disguise. Marine's got a wig on. What happened to your deep sentimental attachment to your father's vintage bike? Ben, it's just a bike. I can put it back together in about a half an hour. That's assuming, of course, I can find that key. So, um, Keith of the Gone Jackals recommended a guy he knew who had a Harley with straight pipes, big old uh, uh, chopper, and every single cylinder stroke sounded literally like a cannon going off. I mean, literally, and that's Ben's bike. And uh, we did a bunch of pass-bys and starts and all the things that you would do. But the best recording that came out was strapping a, a Walkman Pro with a cassette. Uh, it was a cassette recorder, which was actually really good that it wasn't digital, you know, that it was recording onto magnetic tape because uh, it's such a loud uh, sound pressure. And we strapped it on the back of his bike with a gooseneck going to an SM57, uh, which for, for audio people, for people who may not know, uh, is often used on a snare drum. It can take a lot of sound pressure level, these mics. They just, you can, you could mic, you know, can it. It was invented for the military. Oh, really, was it? That's what the Camden said the other day. Wow, okay. So I just strapped it on the back of his bike and he just rode around. And and that ended up being the, you know, the cleanest recordings, the best recordings. We got accelerates, we got steadies, we got all kinds of stuff from that. And much of it was cut in without any processing or pitch shift or anything like that. It was just the sound of that wonderful Harley. So uh, he, uh, the, the driver of that, almost dumped it, though, because it started raining. So we had to store it in the LucasArts lobby. Right, right. Uh, I'll see what I can do. Right. I do remember one time, like, right as we were about to ship, I was testing it at home, like, mm -hmm. all, all night long, trying to crash it. And I, like, started to doze off, and my scary. cat walked across <laughs> the keyboard I remember that. And, and crashed the game. Oh, that's right. The cat <laughs> crashed the <laughs> cat bug. And we could never, your cat would not could reproduce not it. Not reproduce that bug. <laughs> and they were like, oh, we've got to fix it. And it's like, Bring the cat in. Bring get the cat in. Pro. I can't. Did you think that Everybody cat in the credits? Everybody get a what was cat. The, uh, name of we the started cat. bringing cats into the pit. Did you thank it in the credits? What cat was that? Uh, it was Eartha, and she was thanked. Shatterbird. Thank you. This is the last game I ever programmed on, I believe. I remember doing Ben crawling all over the, the, the semi wow. and doing the bunny stuff, which is maybe why I was such a problem. This is an interesting <laughs> a transition for me in learning about uh, schedules and how terrible and hard they are. Because uh, Day of the Tentacle, I feel like, was the last game we did that was on time. Yeah. Like, it, like it, was a, it was not a breeze, but it was like no crutch mode, Smart. followed the schedule. Um, and part of that is because we had an extra six months at the end because of the, adding the voice. Yeah. Right. But, um, and this was the first game that went way over budget that I worked on. And um, I just, and the first time I had a producer, which is Casey. So she would come in. I just remember you asked you <laughs> like a specter. Yeah, she'd come in and be like, uh, "Tim, uh, how? When is this going to be done?" And I just remember that weird feeling of. And I told this to you, like I don't know how to express this, but I feel like you come in and ask me a question, and then I look over to the place where that information is, and I see this empty box with cobwebs in it, and then I come back and I'm like I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> cool. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to present to you the future of Corley Motors. The Corley Minivan. <laughs> Corley was right. I never dreamed it would actually come to minivans, though. So this is the, at the time, this is the worst thing we could think of to happen, which was that the motorcycle company would start making minivans. Because minivans, right, I right. feel like minivans, yes. yeah. they're pretty yeah, new in the 90s, it. right? They're, um, that's true. That's when they emerged. They were the, the epitome of just selling out. I drove one to work. Yeah, I've got one. <laughs> I would love to have one right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that was like the worst vehicle we could think of. It, yeah, it they was. They were really ugly initially, too. And nowadays, it would be like, I don't SUV? No, I don't know. It would be <laughs> something that would imply that a motorcycle <laughs> company had, had sold out completely. Because we were like, how do you make it? You know, motorcycles, they live with a high-risk situation. How do you really threaten 
how do you make something really scary? Like their life is their, their way of life is going to end, and it's that their favorite motorcycle brand would start making the symbol of uh, of uh, normal Dom life. Oh, domesticity. Domesticity. domesticity and suburban exactly. Bliss. Yeah. <laughs> When is it that George, George came down and spoke to us all and he said he had his 55% rule. There was a game that precipitated that. I thought it was 40, but if you get 45% of what you want, then you're... No, 55. Oh, really? Yeah, it was 55. No, it was just over half. He goes, if you got this great idea and you think it's, it's going to be killer and you really, you know, through the realities of relegating it with a team and all the collaboration, all the technical limitations, you get it to 55% of relegating your concept, the audience will get it. And, and it's time to let go and ship your products, folks. Like, come on. Right. This is a business after all. Now, this next slide shows our new, more aggressive corporate strategy. <laughs> Where'd you get the idea of him? It's uh, having a New England accent. It's, re it's really cool. At that bitch fan. I don't hear with these bikers. In this, the the um, voice for this game, I was more removed from it than I would would be on future games. I got really involved in the casting. Oh, okay. stuff. So I was involved in the casting of uh, Ben and stuff, but um, Tamlin, uh, Neilio, and Chris Brown did a lot of it on right. their own, and they went and recorded definitely without me. And so um, I don't remember. I think Tamlin's thing was we got to differentiate all these characters. Right. And that's where a lot of the crazy accents come from. Is like we got to make them stand out well, from each other. They work. They're great. I feel like I I remember programming this part too, because it was all this is all like a reference to Doctor Strangelove. Mm. The code, oh, the code right. that you enter is like right. preserve our essence. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which is Ors, a big Peter, Ors, peace on Ors, Ors, purity yeah. of essence. Yeah, purity of essence, right? Or peace on earth. Pure, yeah, something like that. Mandrake, you ever been a prisoner of war? Yeah. <laughs> why? Why? Well, yes, sir. Yes, Jack. As a matter, as a matter of fact, I have. <laughs> So this is a big question for the remaster because the aspect wave shows wider. Uh -huh. And one of the puzzles here is as you run out of this, you don't see Ben's bike lurking in the corner. Oh. So you try to run for it and then you you blow up. But it was a puzzle to like you have to walk to the left to pan over to see the Ben's bike. But now I think it's just going to show. Oh. Try that again. And the, I think the explosion looks like a giant croissant chasing you out of the plane. <laughs> Watch this. Look for the must croissant. Have been, must have been breakfast. Here it comes. And croissant. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Delicious. Lakey. That's my favorite. Okay, that is a favorite. That's the best oh. shot. Alright then folks, that is a wrap for the series. Let me know your thoughts in the comments and leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed it. Also, if you haven't already watched it, I have a complete series of this game from start to finish on my channel. Links in the description. Bye bye guys, see you in the next playthrough.